to me, let me repeat thy name and lift my heart to thee. <laughs> Oh, 
services every Sunday night. Our musicians, organists and pianists, speakers, and those who have provided our special music, and also the technical team of the band, Charles and John. But most importantly, we wish to express our thanks to you, the congregation, for attending so faithfully week by week. For without you, there will be no epilogue services. We feel this has been a successful series of epilogue services, which have passed so quickly this year. And God willing, we hope to do the same thing and see you all again next year. There is a cup of tea and a coffee for everyone in the hall after the service, 
So don't rush away. We invite you all to join with us for a time of fellowship together. The offering will be taken up during the last hymn. Now, a final announcement about Molly's Ark. Molly's Ark, the local children's cancer charity who we are supporting through this year's epilogue service, will be holding a very special fun run in Moira Domain on Saturday the 2nd, next Saturday. This is to recognise Molly reaching the five-year milestone since she was first diagnosed with rhabdomyosarcoma, <coughs> a childhood cancer. So for those who would be interested in that, more information can be found in the leaflets on the table in the foyer. <coughs> Thank you, Beryl. Um, uh, good evening, everyone. It's, it's wonderful to, to be back with you as I, I near the, the end of, of my sabbatical. And it's great to hear that, that these services have been so faithfully supported during the summer. And, and thank you to everyone who's put so much hard work into uh, putting them on. It, it's a joy to be back uh, worshipping with you again. Uh, one more uh, thing by way of announcement. Um, Molly herself um, sends a thank you message uh, for all our support during the offering of these services to, to support um, the, the, the charity that she and her family funded. So, so from Molly, a happy thank you to you all. Let's stand and sing. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. <laughs>
hearts and prayers as we do. How marvellous, how wonderful is my Saviour's love for me. My Saviour's love for each and every one of us here tonight. For this entire world for whom you gave your life a ransom. We are here worshipping you. But for no other reason than who you are and what you have done. We have access to the throne of God, the throne of the Father, through no other means than our trust in you. Through us relying not on ourselves, but solely on what you have done for us in your death and resurrection. We stand in awe that you, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one who was high and lifted up, heir of all things, that you came not to be served, but to serve and give your life a ransom for all. We thank you for that love that has been poured into our hearts by your Spirit when we put our trust in you. We thank you that we can share it with one another. But united in, in that love, Lord, that you are building us up as a community of, of believers. So whom the world will, will know that we are your disciples because we love one another. Lord, in this time of, of worship, we are all too, too mindful that, that on many occasions we fall short of your glory. We miss the mark. We confess our sins to you, knowing that, that no sin is, is greater than the price you paid to wipe it out. We confess our sins knowing that you are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then cleansing the freedom and the power of your gospel. We worship you tonight. We meet tonight to hear from you, to be changed and transformed by your grace evermore into your likeness. During these sacred moments, we ask through your spirit, you would speak to us. That through our worship, you would be glorified, honoured, lifted up. To you be all praise and honour. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're now going to have an instrumental duet from Joshua and Jeremiah. I will be playing You Are My All in All, um, followed by Susan, who will be singing uh, A Soul for Us, Holy Spirit.
message and based it on our hearts. Thank you. Uh, we turn now to God's Word. Uh, we are reading from uh, the Gospel of Mark, uh, chapter 10, verses 46 to 52. Mark 10, 46 to 52. 
Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, as Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. <coughs> Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he recovered his sight and followed Jesus along the road. We thank God for his word to us. On the 28th of August, 1963, in Washington, D.C., Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. gave one of the greatest speeches in history. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be, will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream that one day right down in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted, every hill and mountain made low, the rough places will be made a plain, and the crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh will see it together. This is our hope. This is the faith that I will go back to the south with. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, pray together, struggle together, go to jail together, stand up for freedom together knowing that one day we will be free. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had weaknesses, flaws, fears and doubts like the rest of us. Yet he was a vessel God used mightily to bring justice and equality to millions. He was a vessel God used mightily because he knew with clarity what he wanted. I have a dream. And he depended on God alone to make that dream a reality. With our faith in God, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. <coughs> His example and the story of Bartimaeus show us how to get off the side of the road in our Christian lives and onto the way <coughs> where we will be transformed, equipped and empowered by Jesus as we follow him. The two steps involved in getting off the side of the road and onto the way, are putting into practice the faith that is able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. And having an answer to the following question which Jesus asked each of us in infinite love, what do you want me to do for you? We look at these steps one by one. Firstly, how do we put into practice the faith that is able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope? We do so by, by letting go of everything we rely on and live for in this world, to rely on and live for Jesus Christ alone. The events of this passage took place just over a week before the very first Easter. Jesus was passing through Jericho on his final journey to Jerusalem, where he was going to die and rise again for the salvation of whosoever believes in him. 
as he was leaving the city. A large crowd was following him, filled with suspense, wonder and trepidation over what he was going to do next. Blind Bartimaeus was sitting at the side of the road. When he heard it was Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth passing by, he cried out at the top of his voice, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Too bad it was this day when Bartimaeus finally got within earshot of Jesus. The day he was going up to Jerusalem with literally the weight of the world on his shoulders, the weight of his father's eternal plan for our salvation on his shoulders, his father's eternal plan to free and restore the entire cosmos. Surely in this moment, the central moment in which all history hinges, Jesus would have been too preoccupied and, and overwhelmed with the task in front of him to stop for a blind beggar whose life was of no significance or value to anyone but the parents who bore him. Nothing could be further from the truth. Verse 49 tells us that Jesus stopped. Jesus stopped and said, call him. The most significant, important, monumental journey ever undertaken in the history of mankind, in the history of this entire cosmos, was caused for the sake of one blind beggar who everyone else ignored and passed by. This is because the divine love in which Jesus was going up to Jerusalem to die and rise again for our salvation. It was not a love for the world as an impersonal object. Rather, it was a love for the world, person by person, from the king on his throne to the pauper at his gate. In the moment when Bartimaeus cried out, Son of David, have mercy on me, there was nothing more important to Jesus than Bartimaeus' cry, and nothing that was too much for him to do for him. So it is for us when we call upon the name of Jesus. In crying out to Jesus, Bartimaeus cast aside a number of things that we also must cast aside if we are to be heard by him. We must cast aside our fear, our self-pity, and our reliance on worldly possessions for status and security. When Bartimaeus shouted out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. <laughs> the crowd told him to be quiet. They did so not only because they thought he was too insignificant to have an audience of Jesus, but also because they were scared. By publicly calling Jesus the son of David, Bartimaeus was proclaiming him and not Caesar to be king. The crowd tried to silence him because they, they feared that the Romans would ruthlessly crush them all as a result of thinking a revolt was beginning. Bartimaeus, with his blinded eyes, saw what the educated religious elite did not see. Now is the time to cast aside all fear, to freely, publicly, boldly confess Jesus as Lord, Saviour and King. Because now he is on his way to establish his kingdom in which we will live with God as his children forevermore simply by believing in the name of his Son. We need not fear any price we have to pay, any loss we might suffer as a result of calling on Jesus' name and standing on his truth. Because everything we have of true and eternal worth is in him, cannot be taken from us by anything that happens to us in the world. Not only did Bartimaeus cast away fear, he also cast away self-pity. As was the case with every beggar of that time, Bartimaeus had suffered a lifetime of indignities, a lifetime of being belittled, ignored, and insulted. But like all beggars of that time, he was immune to this. No put-down or, or demeaning comment caused him to, to withdraw into himself, to, to bemoan the, the unfairness of the hand he had been dealt, 
The harder the crowd knocked him back, that dismissed him and tried to silence him, the more earnestly he called on the name of Jesus. Because the healing, deliverance, and renewal he sought was not to be found in the exercise of self-pity or in the appeasement of man. Rather, it could only be found in the Son of David, who has mercy on all who call on him. Like Bartimaeus, the sooner you learn that self-pity serves no useful purpose and turns every itch it scratches into a gaping wound, the sooner you can turn all your energy from it and, 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 and direct your, your energy towards something that will lead to your healing and renewal. Renew. Namely calling on the name of the one whose mercy, whose love, whose tenderness, whose compassion, whose touch is the answer to your plight. In his cries, son of David, have mercy on me. Bartimaeus cast aside fear, he cast aside self-pity, and also his reliance on worldly objects for security. When he was told, take heart, get up, Jesus is calling you, he threw away his cloak, sprang to his feet, and came to Jesus. As a blind beggar, that cloak was his most important possession. Not only was it essential for keeping him from freezing to death at night, during the day he sat on half of it and folded the other half over his lap. In such a way it formed a pouch for, for passers-by to, to throw their change into. In that moment it was hindering him from coming to Jesus. So he cast it aside as if it were an old, useless rag. As if it were nothing and had never served him or helped him in any way. As those around him saw coins scattering in every direction, they knew who and what he was putting his trust in. Whatever might be hindering you from coming to Jesus, whatever you're living for, holding to, scared to, to let go of him, in order to, to lay hold of him. Throw it aside like that cloak. Call on his name. Like Bartimaeus, you will never be put to shame. You will never look back with regret. In the things of this passing world, whether it be money, possessions, the, the, the praise of those around you. There's no lasting deliverance and fulfillment. There is one name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. That name is Jesus Christ, God's appointed Saviour and King. To get off the side of the road and onto the way, we will be transformed, equipped, empowered, and used mightily by Jesus as you follow him. Cast aside fear, self-pity, and whatever you lean on in this world, in order to call upon the name of Jesus as your Lord, your Saviour, and your King. Because that's who he died and rose again to be. As Jesus stopped for Bartimaeus, Jesus will stop for each and every one of you. In the moment you call, in the moment you cry out in, 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 in desperation, saying, this is the mess I, I'm in, I can't fix it by myself. Help me, save me. There's nothing more important to him than your cry. And nothing he will not do for you. That's how you put into practice the faith that is able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. <clears throat> Step two with regard to getting off the side of the road and onto the way is having an answer to the following question which Jesus asks you in infinite love. What do you want me to do for you? The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords does not say to us as he's entitled to. This is what I want you to do for me. Rather, he asks us, what 
do you want me to do for you? He comes to us in our lowliness, our, our, our bankruptcy, our, our poverty, as last of all, and servant of all. The number one factor that's hindering many Christians from growing and, uh, and being fruitful is not having an answer to this question. What do you want me to do for you? Like Martin Luther King Jr. Do you have a dream about what you want God to do in your own life, your family, your church, your community? Or are you full and sated with what you already have in this world? Are you completely resigned to the fact that this time next year, You'll be struggling with the same vices and, and difficulties that you're currently struggling with, held back by the same timidity, insecurities, and fears that are holding you back now. Or are you asking, expectantly, believing that these things will be blown away because this is what you want Jesus to do for you? Have you concluded that, that there's nothing more God can do in and through my life than what He's doing? Already? Or are you saying, Lord, there has to be more than this. There's got to be more than this. Free my, my lips, my, my, my hands, my feet to do new and greater things for you. I believe you can do it. With regard to your church, do you expect that your living faith in Jesus Christ will unite you as a family who, who love, forgive, support each other no matter what? who work, struggle, and pray together through, through thick and thin for the advancement of the gospel in your community? Or do you have no expectation that your faith will change continually the way you live, worship, and serve together? Because deep down you, you like the boundaries that let Christ and others come this far, but no further. Where you are this evening, Jesus is passing by in the fullness of his transforming, equipping, renewing power. With an abundance of opportunities, blessings and gifts to freely give to us all. As he asks you, what do you want me to do for you? Are you indifferent and apathetic? Or are you bursting with holy dreams and desires that you're desperate for him to fulfill as you follow him? Perhaps this very night, it's time to get off the side of the road and onto the way. <coughs> Cast aside your fears, your self-pity, all you lean on in, in this world, these things that, that cling to you, cry out, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. He will stop. The business of heaven will be paused. As he asks you, what do you want me to do for you? Tell him your, your biggest dreams, your deepest desires. None of these are beyond what he can fulfill, what he can bring you through. You'll be transformed, delivered, equipped and empowered by him as you follow him on the way into all that he has for you. With this faith, you will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. You will work together, struggle together, pray together through every setback and triumph until one day the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh will see it together. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road.
We thank God for his word to us this evening. Amen. I want to sing our last hymn about our Saviour. There is our Redeemer in the collection that will be left. asks each and every one of us where we are now, what do you want me to do for you? Fill our hearts with dreams and desires for the advancement of your kingdom in and through your lives and in through our, our, our churches. That, that only you can fulfill. We go forth from here dependent on you, knowing that, that you will turn the mountain of despair into a stone of hope. Thank you for the hope and joy and peace you fill our hearts with. The reminder to trust in you above and before all else. Lord, for, for the supper we are about to receive, we give you thanks. We thank you for the hands that have prepared it. I ask that you would bless it to your bodies as we continue in fellowship together in your name and presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. 